As we celebrate our 40, 40th anniversary, uh, I think it's safe to just uh, uh, state the obvious. 40 years ago, so there was little gender equity in science. We have made great progress over the 40 year, last 40 years, but we're clearly not where we need to be uh, today. And it's my great hope that in the coming years, uh, by bringing a clear and purposeful focus to this issue, we will reach gender, gender equity. But let me state the obvious, that in the wonderful morning session we heard, which was, as you could tell, largely looking historically at the early part uh, of uh, Gladstone's history, we had an all-male uh, session. And that is reflective of where science had been over the last several decades. Uh, it's also it pr probably important to note that the second half of our program today will be 50% men, 50% women. And that is what our hope is for all aspects of science to be going forward. So uh, with that, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, our moderators, uh, Jeanette Osterlo and Melanie Das, who are both uh, here at Gladstone, and they will moderate a very interesting discussion with our panelists, uh, Cricket Seidman, Katie Parlard, Carla Kirkgaard, and Mark Tessier-Levine from Stanford. So if I could invite everybody to the stage, uh, they'll take it from here. <laughs> so hello, good morning. I'm Melanie Doss, this is Jeanette Osterlo. Um, thank you for coming and attending this session. Thank you to Deepak and Bethany Taylor for giving us this space and opportunity um, to lead this important discussion and giving us the prime time pre-lunch spot. Um, I think that's a silent commitment to the cause. Um, and also very much a thank you to our panelists for the extra time and dedication, the uh, support for um, being attending this panel. And with that, I will get started. Um, so the purpose of this panel is to hear um, from our panelists their experiences and their strategies in navigating the scientific workplace, building a more inclusive environment, and advocating for gender parity. Um, we created a series of uh, questions for this moderated panel, and we encourage everyone to engage um, with the speakers directly during lunch and beyond. Great, thank you, Melanie. Um, so I'd first like to start by saying diversity comes in many forms. That includes gender, race, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, and thought. All of those are important to discuss, but today we'll focus specifically on uh, the representation of women at scientific institutions. So as Deepak alluded to, uh, a National Center for Education Statistics report in 2016 showed that women are earning nearly 60% of bachelor degrees in bi biology and the biomedical sciences. However, according to a recent report by the NIH, women constitute less than one-fourth of all full professorships in those disciplines, um, and that is to both research institutions as well as teaching intensive institutions. Women are similarly underrepresented among physician scientists, and in chair and dean positions at medical schools. So today, as Melanie said, we'll discuss inclusive environments, breaking down barriers to achieve gender parity, particularly in leadership positions um, and mentorship. So the first question I will direct to Carla. Um, what do you do to promote gender equity within your own lab or department? Well, we were just discussing this at the break, how to create local environments that foster communication. And one of the things that I think people often don't do is listen to each other. So often there are more silent people in the room or, or those who say, who make a comment and then another person says 10 minutes later the same comment because that person is perceived as more, having more power or they talk louder um, they get credit for the idea. This is something that happens very frequently, and I think we should all be mindful of it. Because, um, well, here's, here's, a, here's a question. What percentage of the people in the world are white males? How small? 7.4. Um, yeah, just, just saying. So anyway, so, so sometimes it's not always the men in the room, not always, you know, of course, who interrupt 
or who take inappropriate credit for ideas. I think in general for all of us, in order to get the um, expertise of everyone in the world, uh, we have to listen and make sure the people who are quieter or have accents or whatever are heard. So one of the things that we're very careful to do in my lab and I call out when it happens in the department is if anyone is interrupted after the interrupter stops speaking, you say, what were you going to say? And if you know somebody has a good idea and then another person kind of takes credit for it, you say, well, actually, you know, Susan said that 10 minutes ago and I completely agree with both of you. <laughs> but we have to do that for each other, not just, not just women for women, although I'm suggesting that here, but for other people too, for quiet ones, and I know, I know men who do that for me um, at the end of discussions. I know we, I, we've been in groups together, and at the end, if um, no one said anything, if, if I haven't said anything, you say, um, what are you thinking? Or it, it's just a, a common courtesy to make sure that all voices are heard. And I think in doing that, you empower everyone to feel better about themselves, and you just create that going forward. Um, actually, can I also get your opinion on the same question? Sure. Um, so I would 100% agree with you, um, but I would be a bit more directive um, when I'm assuming a role of teaching and mentorship. Um, all of us have lab meetings. Uh, every Monday morning at 9 a.m. is when our lab meeting runs. And people are tired from their weekends, uh, and they may be late in arriving, but within a couple of minutes, science is happening. And it is not a uh, dialogue of one person to the other. It's meant to be interactive, so we can call on people. And I think that that helps to hear those voices. And we do that. Um, we is another way in which in my lab we pr promote gender equity because we means I'm one of another. Um, so my husband and I, John, run the lab together. And um, all of the mentorship and all of the discussions are with both of us. And I think that that has certainly helped to have our women uh, trainees as well as our men recognize that there are two forces in the room. Uh, and both of them should be listened to um, and considered, and sometimes their opinions rejected, and it's pretty 50-50, although sometimes I win more. Um, <laughs> but calling on, I think, is really an important thing, and in addition, I make an effort um, when we have our lab meeting, the speaker is a person we spend considerable time with afterwards, about 90 minutes to two hours. Uh, and that's a time to really discuss not just science, but that person's goals, aspirations, and how to accomplish them now. Not in the future, but how to really step up now. I think that, that prompting helps. I think that encouragement helps. And I think that um, it's something that we have seen people mature um, over the time in the lab. And it works beautifully. Thank you very much. And if you, if anyone wants to add, and even though we're directing questions at certain people, please feel free. Um, you have the space to do so. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question. This one's for Katie. Um, what are some personal experiences or compelling arguments that you may have um, that have influenced your thinking around gender representation in the sciences? Thanks for asking about that. Um, it's something I think about all the time. Um, I have two types of answers. One pertains to the scientists themselves, and the other is about our institutions. Um, so I'll start with the scientists, but I actually think where we need to do the most work is on the institutional side. Um, and I believe strongly that improving representation isn't only about helping women to be better scientists or to help each other, but it's about institutions changing so that it's the right place for women to work. Um, but on the side of the scientists, the two things that have been most important to me um, are things that help me answer the question, do I belong here? Um, will, will it be fun? Will I enjoy being here or not? And those are uh, community and role models. So um, a book that I read when I was first starting my career called Every Other Thursday details some of the first female professors in the Bay Area. Um, who got together because there were so few of them and had lunch every other Thursday as a support group. And um, I uh, 
I'm sad that so many years later, I don't actually have what they had many years ago. Um, but I do have a few key female colleagues that I'm able to talk to and to get feedback from, and that community is invaluable. Um, perhaps more important is role models. And again, um, this has been insufficient for me personally. Um, but I had a, a really uh, important experience at an early stage of my career that helped me to get where I am now. And that was as an undergraduate. I was a math major. Um, I was sort of on the fence about majoring in math. It didn't look like that much fun. And it also didn't look like something that women did. Um, and I had a male professor in my freshman year say, you're really good at this. You should major in math. And I said, thanks. I'm not sure if I'm going to do that. And I signed up to major in anthropology. Um, I later ended up adding the math major, and it was completely due to the fact that we hi had two female professors in the department. One had been there, but I hadn't met her yet at that point in my career, and the other was a new hire. And uh, it was a small department, so they were actually two out of about six professors. So that was a decent ratio, but the thing that they did um, was to, both of them, interestingly, were teaching at a, a national level summer camp for women in math. So women who were majoring in math around the country came to the Bay Area, actually to UC Berkeley, and did math at a graduate level, we were undergrads at the time, um, at Berkeley um, with all female TAs and all female faculty and only women in the classroom. And it was a completely transformative experience for me. I came back and I was like, I'm gonna be a math major. And what was important wasn't just seeing these women be excellent mathematicians, but I got to know them personally. And the, am I gonna have fun question was answered by one of these women who um, decided to perform with my rock band. And um, <laughs> it was like just a person I could say I'd like to be like her. Um, and I had never had that before, and I'm sad to say I haven't had much of that since my undergrad. My mentors since then have been entirely male, um, and there aren't enough women role models out there. Um, so I think we need more. So that's on the side of the scientists. So if you give me just another minute, I'd like to talk about the institutional side. Um, so we are not doing enough to um, change representation in science, and I think this comes through both conscious and unconscious bias, and I'm gonna point out a few places where it plays out. Um, the most one of the most important is when we get started, and it's in recruiting. And um, a personal experience I've had um, it, over and over again is to be on a search committee and to have a female candidate um, spoken negatively about and in terms that I'm sure people would not use with a male candidate. Um, she wasn't assertive enough or loud enough or why hasn't she been to enough conferences or things that are, are completely gender biased statements um, and reflect things that men value and recognize in other men and that they um, are overlooking amazing qualities in this female candidate. So um, I'm sure we can all think of other examples but I think our recruiting process needs to be better. Um, we also need to look at what we uh, value in terms of success, and that comes out through promotions, also through awards, funding opportunities, speaking invitations, um, and other forms of networking opportunities that are um, both consciously and unconsciously biased towards helping men and not women. Um, and uh, a sort of positive thing I want to mention um, is our seminar series here at Gladstone, which was very skewed towards male speakers for the last decade or so. And a group of us got together and decided to try to change this a few years ago. And we did a number of things. Um, but I think the most effective one was to change the uh, group of people that had input on inviting speakers. And, and one thing in particular was asking trainees to invite speakers. And without even saying anything about asking them to invite more diverse speakers, the diversity of the speakers improved. Um, so it just shows that uh, broader input on all of these decisions, um, including the promotions and the awards and the speaking opportunities, I think um, with even without consciously trying to change anything, can change things. And if we add to that like a more conscious effort, hey, let's pay attention to this, who are we inviting, then I think we can make a difference. Um, the last example I want to give is around authorship. Um, I do a lot of collaboration and um, uh, co-author a lot of papers. And I've been um, pretty aggressive throughout that whole time to make sure the people in my lab um, are positioned properly on the paper, getting proper credit for their work. I have not advocated particularly well for myself. 
Um, I think it's more important, and, and that's probably the right decision. If there's gonna be a bunch of conflict over the authorship, I would rather promote the, the people in the lab. I think that's more, it's, it has more value for them than it does for me um, at this point in my career. But I noticed, um, and in fact a male colleague helped point this out to me, that over a decade of collaborating, a lot of collaborations with more than one senior author, I'm almost never the last or most senior author. I thought, huh, maybe it should occasionally be the other way around. And so I've started just really in the last few months requesting that in these collaborations. Um, but I think uh, that's just another example of, of sort of unconscious on my part bias and, and also on the part of my colleagues. So thanks for asking a really important question. Thank you, Katie. Um, I want to move to Mark. First, I want to ask, is this your first panel where you've been the only male speaker? <laughs> uh, it's quite possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Making more history at Gladstone today, great. <laughs> Trying to think back through all the panels. <laughs> great. Um, well, Mark, as president of Stanford, you're in a unique position to make some of these institutional changes to promote gender equity. Uh, can you talk about some of the ideas or policies or initiatives um, at your institution to help promote um, inclusion for women, particularly in leadership? Great, well maybe um, I can, uh, first maybe I'll draw on two sets of experiences currently as, as president of Stanford, but before that I was president of Rockefeller University. And just to give you some statistics, uh, uh, at Rockefeller when I started, uh, only 14, which was a, it's, that's just a biomedical research university, a small research university. Um, about the size of the Gladstone, I guess. Um, the uh, only 14% of the faculty were women, uh, and that was, you know, one of my first priorities in my inaugural address uh, to address that. And we, there are a number of learnings there that I, I, I'd like to share. Now, currently at um, at Stanford, uh, when I started, 28% of the faculty were women. Uh, the data are, are very clear, and there are, of course, many more faculty, over 2,000. Um, it's been a straight line for about 25 years of increase, and, and um, it takes a long time to turn over a faculty, but the, uh, in terms of hiring, it's not quite 50-50 right now in faculty, but it's, it's uh, not far off. Um, so it takes a long time to, to do that, but it's, it's a straight line up. Um, maybe I can start with uh, issues about inclusion, but uh, I think there were some really good points made about recruitment also, so maybe I could say a few words about that too. And, and with inclusion, I just want to echo uh, the, the very first comments that were made um, uh, about uh, uh, having to work, um, uh, you know, think locally, uh, think uh, um, globally, but act locally. Um, that you have to try to create a culture in whatever environment you're in um, that is uh, inclusive. And we heard some really good uh, points on that in terms of calling on people, um, uh, how to behave if people interrupt, and so forth. Um, I want to talk about some, uh, so, so those are very, very important issues, but uh, I know you asked me about at an institutional level, so let me tell you about Stan uh, some of the things that I, I see at Stanford that are very important. The first is uh, in a large organization uh, like Stanford that's very sprawling uh, and where there's um, a lot of variation between departments um, as well. Uh, the importance of um, networking opportunities and support opportunities. So uh, one of the first groups I, I went to meet with when I got to Stanford was the Women's Faculty Forum, uh, where the, the women faculty get together to talk about the issues uh, that they are facing, uh, their, their aspirations, uh, the challenges they, they see, uh, and how to address them. And that network is in incredibly important and, and so people can, can share experiences and see that they're not alone in experiencing things, share best practices, how to tackle things. Um, I guess Carla is a member of the Women's Faculty Forum, so she could tell us uh, more about it in detail. But uh, for me, it was very important to go meet um, early on and to see that it's a, a very robust and um, uh, 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 active and supportive network. It's not the only one at Stanford. There are other organizations, Women in Science and Engineering, WISE, um, is also a more recent um, organization that also uh, focuses specifically on women in the sciences and in engineering. Um, and, uh, and then uh, a lot of departments and graduate programs have uh, uh, mechanisms as well. And I think for uh, any group um, that is uh, underrepresented, having those kinds of uh, organizations uh, for mutual support is very important, and it's very important for us as an administration to support them, to support them through encouragement, of course, by showing up, listening, and also monetarily providing resources uh, for that. So that's number one. 
Uh, number two, um, and this has already been alluded to, the importance of role modeling and, and in the case of an institution like Stanford, of having women in visible leadership positions. Uh, when I arrived, our, our, uh, the, the provost, um, and I think maybe the students here don't know the difference between a president and a provost, but the, the, the provost is a chief academic officer. Uh, the president is very outward looking in many ways. Uh, and it's really a partnership between the president and the provost in terms of running an institution uh, like Stanford. Um, the the long-standing provost had, had announced that he was going to step down after over a decade. Um, and we started a search and it was pretty clear to me that um, uh, it was gonna be important to, uh, the base case was that uh, I wanted a, a woman to be the, the provost. Of course, we uh, ran a search, we went for the best candidates, and guess what, the best candidates were women, uh, and I selected just an extraordinary partner, uh, Persis Durell, a physicist, um, who has been you know, my thought partner, and we uh, work together every day uh, on everything. Um, the, uh, so that's, uh, having um, uh, people in uh, uh, that kind of visibility is important, but it's important for it not just to be isolated individuals. Uh, and we have worked together, Persis and I, to make sure that our, our leadership teams uh, have as much gender balance um, as possible. There are two major t uh, teams. There's sort of the administrative side, the vice presidents, and then the uh, academic side, the executive cabinet, that's more deans and provosts and, uh, and the like. Uh, and I have the statistics here that um, on, on the, um, in terms of the academic side, the executive cabinet, six of the 14 um, are female. Four of them actually are, are, are STEM um, uh, uh, scientists. And uh, on the Stanford, of course, has all disciplines. Um, and on the administrative side, um, uh, six of 13 are, are female. And, and having that visible rep representation is important. Um, uh, a, a very, um, uh, uh, I think telling story for me was uh, talking to one of our, our clinical chairs, uh, a man who was very concerned about the lack of representation and the difficulty he was having in recruiting women. And so he decided to, to um, when uh, uh, creating visible leadership positions, to put as many women as possible in those positions, including the key one of heading the, um, uh, the search committee uh, and recruitment. And uh, that visibility gave comfort to the women who were applying and brought them in and his recruitment just changed uh, dramatically and he's turned around uh, the department in that sense. So, uh, it, and one has to be intentional, deliberate and work at it um, every day. You can't leave things um, uh, to chance. Um, last thing about the institution um, uh, is uh, we have to work day in, day out to try to create a respectful work environment. Uh, and we do that, we try to do that both with bottoms up and top down approaches. The bottoms up is that every employee um, has to take, you know, uh, go through um, regular sexual harassment training. There also, um, we have a, um, uh, a program called uh, a respectful work environment where uh, uh, the um, uh, administrators will come and present to departments um, uh, the do's and the don'ts. So it's very important to engage people on a daily basis. From the top, um, it, it's also important to, to talk to leadership. Uh, we have 130 departments, so 130 chairs of departments. Um, we have you know, five schools, and uh, it's hard for the message to diffuse through. Um, and so what we started doing in the last few years, we have uh, one of the senior vice provosts for academic affairs together with one of our um, attorneys. Um, they go and meet with chairs as groups, and, uh, and they present to them uh, and also they did this at the Faculty Senate. Uh, this is under privilege. Uh, they present types of behaviors um, that um, uh, have occurred at the university and the sanctions that went with them so that it's eye-opening, I think, sometimes to the chairs to hear that this happened, that this typically man behaved in this way towards this woman and here was the consequence. And it brings it you know, very vividly and viscerally uh, to life. You have to confront what's happening it has to be done under privilege because, of course, a lot of this is uh, under confidence. But that helps prime the chairs to think about this and think about the environment that they have as well. Um, it's a big laundry list in, in some sense uh, because I don't think there's one lever. You can't just pull one lever and hope they'll go away. You really have to attend to every single lever uh, at, at all levels. Maybe just a few words about recruitment because I think the uh, uh, at Rockefeller, we were very concerned about that. 
And we went at it systematically and, and uh, got input from social scientists who have been studying this problem. And again, in the, the, the concept of there's no one lever, you have to attend to every piece. So first, it's not sufficient to um, just put out an ad and think that people are going to apply to you, the best candidates will. You know what, there's a law out there that Rockefeller's not hospitable to women, so guess what? Women don't apply. You have to actually have to work at identifying candidates. You call up all your colleagues to say, and then you have to go and, in a very retail fashion, talk to them and say, no, Rockefeller is actually a hospitable place. Please apply. Um, you have to eradicate, or work hard to eradicate impl implicit bias in the recruiting process. It's incredibly well documented um, that it's there. And the social scientists have given us some tools. So there's very good data showing that if you take a search committee and you do 30 minutes of implicit bias training, where mostly what you're, you're telling the people is that this happens, so they recognize it, that the amount of implicit bias decrease, or the outcomes improve dramatically. Now, probably not perfectly, but as little as half an hour can make a big difference. So we should do that systematically. At Rockefeller, it became mandatory for all search committees to have that, that training. Even if people had been through it before, there are always new members, people forget, and so forth. How you interview really matters. We had to coach people in interviewing, uh, interviewing a broader pool, which we did by doing Skype interviews first before narrowing the pool. We saw improved our ability to identify the best candidates. And what we found, in fact, in the years that I was there, that um, we would enrich for women uh, in the pool as we went along. And, and that reflects something that the social scientists have also shown. It's very important to know. The pool is not unbiased. Um, there are very good data showing that if you put out an ad and that there are, um, for example, five criteria, you know, to apply to this job, you need to, you know, these are the five things we're looking for, that on average, this is, these are all averages, statistical, that women will say, gosh, I don't meet two of them, so I'm not going to apply. Whereas the men will say, gosh, I meet one or two of them, so I will apply, right? <laughs> Um, and uh, so you have to be very careful about how you phrase your ad. And I think because of that type of thing, we, we found consistently that we, um, we enriched for women um, as we went through. And the, the upshot of that is that we, uh, uh, this is after I left Rockefeller, I was there for five years. First we started increasing, and in fact in one of the most re recent um, years, I think last year, all four offers were made to mid-career, to junior, to, to women. Um, uh, who might not have applied, you know, five years ago without these mechanisms. So you have to attend to every single piece. You have to avail yourself of the best social science research that can tell you what the problems are and how you can try to alleviate them. And I think it's only with that kind of intentionality day in, day out, that we will really be able to make progress. I'm sorry I went on a little long, but there are a lot of learnings. Um, and in fact, it's not that many. And we should just make sure that we put them all to work every day. Thank you, and thank you for all these really thoughtful examples. Um, moving on, so the next question is directed at Cricket. Um, w um, this is about professional development. Um, what do you think are some of the current systemic challenges um, when it comes to things like networking or committee work, and how do you see the field overcoming them? So I think that um, many of these networking issues are institutional specific. Um, and are complicated by the relative paucity of women um, in higher levels of the academic structure. Um, so Harvard, for example, has, an exa has as a rule that at certain levels of um, institutional roles, you have to be at the professorial rank. Um, and that becomes a way of not having more women at the professorial rank uh, who are not at the professorial pr participating um, in these roles. So that leadership becomes, uh, by default, a male-dominated structure. That can change by simply changing the rule. Um, associate professors, assistant professors have as much to contribute and often more than more senior faculty members on many of, of these forums. So having that occur really requires not a change from the potential participants, but a change from the structure of the institution. I think that's um, something that's really important and something that can occur and largely does not reflect a gender committee to go and say this is a crazy rule, but it does take some work and that's something that we certainly have, I have been involved in and it has made a difference. It's made a huge difference. Um, 
I'm sorry, say again your second question. I had a, a concern there for a moment. Mm. I got distracted. Oh, no, I mean, I think you answered everything. It's uh, committing to networking right. and committee work, I so guess. So a, a related thing, um, I think, has to do with the fact that when there are few women at particular ranks um, that are eligible to be involved in different forums, um, that same small cadre of people are used over and over and over again. <laughs> that is not helpful to their academic careers um, in science or in medicine or whatever uh, domain of field they are investigating. And, and so again, I think that the question is why should that be? If there are that few women, um, one obviously long-term solution is to change the numbers. But again, I think a lot of this has to do with why is it that we have sort of traditional roles that with seniority at an academic rank comes wisdom. Um, I think there are some very wise young people and using those in appropriate situations is equally um, beneficial. So again, I think that um, it's a matter of pointing out what seems illogical and therefore inherent biases uh, and structuring careers that allow people to participate regardless of where their academic rank is, so long as obviously they are competent and, and want to participate and can be actively engaged. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm actually gonna go off script for a moment because I think one of the things that helps build the confidence to do that is to have a, a community around you to talk about. Um, and I know Mark mentioned you, there's a strong community at Stanford. So Carla, could you speak to that? And how has that shaped your um, personal development and, and how has that support system helped you? I think this is on, yeah. Well, I wanted to add to the committee problem <laughs> about that because, you know, as a more senior woman, you get invited. It's ridiculous. I mean, you can't say yes to all these things. So that makes you a jerk on top of being too busy. <laughs> you end up doing three times more than other pe than, than your colleagues, and you're a jerk because you say no to half of them. So, so that's <laughs> not good for your self-esteem or, you know, a lot of things. What I do want to say is that I've given a lot of thought to what to say yes to, and some of it's informed by the unconscious bias thing. Now, let's assume that all of us have unconscious bias, and that it's not that anyone has less than anyone else, but it turns out that if you're the kind of person that is a minority of any sort, and you're in the room, it changes the unconscious bias, assuming your colleagues like you. <laughs> but you know, even just it, with respect to other kinds of bias, they've done studies, and even if there's a picture of Martin Luther King on the wall, the, the black people get better attention. And I think if you, as a, you know, any kind, yeah, as a woman, are, on the, are present in the room, it, it changes the unconscious bias. So I say yes to search committees, I say yes to too many, but I do say, I, I say no to, you know, biosafety <laughs> um, and, you know, library and this kind of stuff, but I do say yes to search committees. Um, that wasn't your question. Your question no, was about great. That's my great community. insight, though, about community. Um, one other thing that um, I can't help but point out is in all of these very important and long-standing institutions, there are pictures on the walls. And um, there's a message in those pictures. It's meant to portray accomplishments, gravitas, and institutional strength. And it would seem to me that that's a very small mechanism by which we could diversify what are our strengths. Um, I will candidly tell you, uh, at Harvard Medical School, um, there is a central building. Um, it used to be called Building One, uh, and it houses where faculty meetings occur at the professorial rank, and there are some wonderful pictures, oils of deans around the walls, and in the major auditoriums of all of the academic hospitals. Only recently have the profiles of those individuals begun to change. That's important. I will also say I was disappointed that the oil paintings have not been replaced by more and recent oil paintings, but of black and white photographs. 
Um, and I'm struck with still the difference in the quality of recognition, if you will, uh, that I think is unfortunate. Um, and I think those are small but significant ways of saying these people matter, and they matter as much as the individuals who've come before them. So. Thank you. Actually, that reminded me there was a big um, viral Twitter hashtag that went out. That was hashtag, I think it was Manwall or something. And there was actually a movement to start um, putting up pictures. And you know, maybe with our new lobby redesign, that could be something that we could implement pretty easily as well. Um, you're next. <laughs> yeah. um, Okay, Katie, I'd like to ask you um, specifically about your experience here at, at Gladstone. Um, now that you're a leader as, and as a director of an institution, do you feel that you're treated differently than you were before as a junior faculty member? Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, I can't help but say uh, more invitations. Um, maybe I'll be on the wall. I am on the wall of my math department building at Pomona, <laughs> actually, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but not here yet. Um, uh, so, so all that to say, I really uh, I love the comments of other people. Um, so I'll just briefly answer this one. I would say I'm grateful that mostly I don't feel like I'm treated differently. And I think that's important to me personally. I also think it's important because of the comments we've heard from others about, about the value in having power and decisions and influence not just come from the top and having a more broad engagement and directing where the institution goes. And if that's true, then I shouldn't be treated a lot differently than anybody else. Um, and for the most part, I haven't felt that. But there are two things I wanna say about how I feel different um, as a director now. Um, one is something that I'd heard before and I hadn't realized um, uh, until I experienced it, which is that leaders are inherently lonely. You're always, you know, if you're at the top of some group of people, there are certain things that are just yours to own and deal with. Um, and I think, although I'm not sure, that, that, that you may feel more lonely as a female leader. Um, the other thing I wanted to comment on um, is what we, and it relates to something Cricket said about what we value, um, the gravitas or the, the things that those oil paintings represent. Um, and so I wanted to tell a story, um, it's a little personal, it's about my uh, recent 360 performance review, um, but I wanna share it, which is, um, that we, we filled out surveys and were, were ranked on a bunch of uh, different scales about things we were, were good at or not good at. And um, those scores are reported back as how did you score um, compared to the median of other people in your role. And uh, in my case, that's compared to a bunch of men, right? There isn't you know, another woman. And if you even compare me to like all full professors, it's also mostly men. And so I scored low on dominance using my power um, to make change in the institution. I think I'm actually pretty good at doing that. Um, uh, but it just shows that there are other people who score a lot higher on that than me. And so should the, should the median of this not diverse group of people be the standard or not? And I was really grateful that in discussing it with Deepak, he actually said, I don't really think you need to change very much to move towards that median. Maybe we need to change the median. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge. <laughs> That explains a lot, um, but, um, but, um, but I, so I just wanted to point that out, um, and I appreciated Deepak's support on that. I, I sort of appreciated the insight it gave me about like what these medians represent and, and, and what we sort of value um, in a leader. Great, thank you. I'd actually like to pose that question to Carla and Cricket as well. How have, um, how people have treated you changed as you've um, grown and become more um, and taken on more leadership roles within your institution? Um, they give me more errands. Um, <clears throat> no, I, I mean, I'm serious. I, I, I agree. I don't think it's changed that much. Um, maybe I'm not noticing, but... Because um, I change, too, of course. There's more to do. There's, Yeah, but I mean, I sometimes go in indirect routes from here to there so people don't stop me and tell me to do something, <laughs> ask me to do something, et cetera. Um, no, I, I, I felt valued all along since coming to Sanford. I will say that. I would agree. Um, I think perhaps the only change I would say is that I have the impression that when you achieve something, 
that people who want to also achieve think you know the answer of how to do it. And um, again, I think from the people who come to me with questions and concerns about how to structure their academic career and their personal lives, the first thing I have to tell them is there is no answer. There are many answers. I picked some of them, and you will probably pick different ones. But I, I think that the sort of only change I've appreciated is that people think there is something they ought to do. And I go out of my way to say, no, <laughs> you need to do what's right for you. And I think that that's a message that, in particular, is very important for women. Um, they're trying to balance many issues, often uh, not just their careers, but their personal lives are usually more complicated than men because of children. Uh, and I think that is wonderful and would not in any way um, be something that they should forego, put off or otherwise ignore uh, when they are in the lab. There's been changes in terms of parental leaves and parental involvement, which has also been terrific. And so young men and middle-aged men as well come and discuss these same issues. But there is not, and in this panel, there are not you know, answers. There are only ideas and opportunities. And again, I think that they should be varied and multiple, and they're all right. Thank you. Um, so for the next question directed at Carla, and I think Mark alluded to some of these um, responses, was how can we encourage more men to support women pursuing, obtaining, and thriving in a leadership position? And what are specific actions that you may think that men could take? Um, well, that's a, thanks for asking that question, because there's a lot. Um, <laughs> 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 right. <Not sure. laughs> um, okay, so I had an epiphany about, it was probably five years ago, I was at a meeting, and it was, it was a pretty um, unusual meeting. It was a Pioneer Award meeting, so it was a lot of people who were really strong researchers. And I will say it was, you know, there were many fewer women than men at this award um, symposium. And the first day, I mean, the first, yeah, the first day I was watching the behaviors of, um, of people. And there are so many little knots. I mean, I think this will be familiar to everyone in the room with the knots of people with the alpha male in the middle and the sycophants around. Yeah, and, um, and everybody's trying to get the attention of the alpha male. And, and you know, it's just something you observe and you think, I'm not going near that, man. <laughs> And I just think it's, it's I, I decided that men weren't really trying to diss me. They're just crazy about each other. Um, <laughs> professionally, I mean, you know, they're raised to like try to please, their, I, 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 I can't even pretend to know why that is. But, but I, I think when you find yourself in that situation, it's not good for anyone. If you're the alpha male in the center, how good is that for you? If you're the, if you're the, the hanger on who's trying to impress that person, it's not good for you. Just break it up and talk to somebody else. It, it creates a very exclusion. I mean, it just creates the atmosphere that I think we all know about. Just, just don't do that. <laughs> that that's um, one of the number one things about exclu exclusive, being ex creating an exclusive environment that I would say. Um, the other is that there's no reason that childcare and having children is a women's issue. I mean, unless, unless you're a single woman, it's, we're working for the time that it's not a women's issue. And just try to think about that. We hope you all continue this discussion at lunch as well, but we'd like to, to wrap it up and ask each of the panelists the same question. And that is, how do you pay it forward and support female junior scientists and colleagues? I think they're half of the best students, trainees, and people I work with. And I have no trouble about saying that. And they are welcomed to be in my lab as a trainee. They are welcome to be in my environment um, as a colleague. 
and I have had no trouble about endorsing them for every possible opportunity that comes around, whether that is, yes, you should write that grant, yes, I think you should go and give this talk, um, yes, I think that you should complain and go and talk to X, Y, or Z because of that, um, and to simply say, you can do this, and you will enjoy yourself and your career if you figure out what you want to do and just go for it. Women are incredibly powerful and competent, and the world is as open to them as it is for men. We will live longer than the guys around us. <laughs> so we better make it the world we want to live in. I tell you two. <laughs> it's hard to add anything to that. Um, <laughs> um, I just wanted to echo the importance of sponsoring and nominating uh, women, that we, we should be doing that as women. I also want to encourage men with the power to do that, um, to always think about doing that. Um, the other thing that, um, that, that junior female colleagues can count on me for is um, to try to tirelessly push for changes in the institution and how we conduct ourselves as scientists um, that will make doing what I'm doing more inviting to you. Um, I completely agree that uh, children and childcare and breastfeeding and all these things are not exclusively women's issues. I'm glad you said that. Um, this affects everybody. Um, so for both men and women, um, I would really like to see some changes around what happens uh, when people do make a choice to have children. This, that was one of the hardest times for me, being a new mom and trying to advance my career at the same time. And that is despite the fact I had a lot of empathy from the not dominant but empathetic Deepak, <laughs> who also had twins like I did, um, and very good intentions on his part and the parts of ma many of my colleagues. But there are still so many opportunities where I felt very anxious about missing an event, especially events in the evenings that I was gonna lose out on networking opportunities um, or uh, important conversations. Um, uh, also, long meetings where there wasn't a break to breast pump um, were really challenging for me. It's quite embarrassing to have to excuse yourself. There wasn't really an easy way to do that. Um, these are really simple things that we could do differently. And I think that, um, that, that what I was hoping for was that someone would just ask me, you know, should we have this event at the evening or would, you, would it work better for you if that we had done it at lunchtime? Or uh, how often do you need to have a break? Um, so you can count on me, the junior people here, I will ask you those questions. Okay. Well, maybe I can talk about myself as a head of lab also because I think that's perhaps more directly germane. And, and what I have to say here really echoes very much what's already been said. The, the first thing, and, and the first thing goes back to um, what I said earlier about recruitment. Uh, that I see it as um, uh, incredibly important for me to actively seek out you know, talented women, um, the recognizing that there are lots of obstacles to them coming forward, to them potentially coming to, to my attention. Um, so uh, really seeking out, and, and uh, it goes back to you know, promoting um, uh, also women, it, and it works multiple ails just to jump to um, a sidebar uh, at Rockefeller, there is a prize, the Perlmeister Greengard Prize, that um, Paul Greengard, uh, the Nobel laureate, used uh, his Nobel earnings. Uh, he and his wife, uh, Ursula von Reidingsvard, uh, uh, an artist, decided to put that money into a prize that recognizes um, a women scientists because there was a sense that they were not being, um, they were being overlooked in other committees, and by focusing specifically on them, First, they could recognize the women, and secondly, bring them to the attention of other prize committees. So thinking about ways to um, have steps of encouragement and recognition as well. So that's number one. Number two, in terms of the work in environment, um, and again, the, the point is absolutely correct. This is, should be true for both men and women, but we've also heard about how, um, in some cases, this can uh, affect women more. Um, the, my view when I you know, set up my lab in the first place, I never had meetings on weekends and, or in the evenings. Um, I figured people had lives. I, when I started my lab, we had a one-month-old baby, um, our, our first son, and uh, my wife was working. Um, and 
uh, I discovered that a lot of things at UCSF, where I was on the faculty, happened in the evenings and on weekends. A lot of the meetings with graduate students, for example. You know, I didn't attend those. It was to my disadvantage. Um, and, uh, but it, it, but it, I think by having my lab set up that way, um, it was more inclusive, I guess, of the, the people who were in the lab and always been supportive. Uh, it made it very clear um, uh, when people have asked me, often the women uh, applicants, you know, what's your view about, you know, if I'm pregnant, if I uh, need to take leave um, or want to take leave, and I've always been very relaxed about that. I think that it's, it's important to just provide a, uh, a supportive environment and good things will happen. Um, the, um, uh, lastly, I, I think um, supporting, uh, and this point also has been made, but I want to underscore it also, um, supporting when I look at my trainees, making sure that I keep in touch with them and talk to them and support them as they, they uh, deal with new situations and often questions like, um, gosh, this job became available, I'm not sure I'm qualified for that, or, um, and being saying, yes, you are absolutely qualified, trust me. Um, uh, again, going back to the statistics I had earlier about um, uh, women looking at job advertisements and being more likely to say, oh gosh, I, you know, I shouldn't apply to that. In my experience with my trainees, I've seen more women wonder, am I qualified for this, when they are eminently qualified and where the men are not questioning themselves about their qualifications. So supporting uh, the trainees to say, yes, go for it if you want to. Um, you don't have to do this, but you are absolutely qualified. And um, uh, you know, one of my trainees was in that, she was number two in an organization, questioning whether she should go for the number one position. And she did, became number one, and had a you know, brilliant career in that. This was not in bench science, but in a science-related field. Um, and uh, you know, without the encouragement, not just from myself, but by, from others as well, I'm not sure that she would have taken that step. Um, so encouraging, supporting, mentoring is very important too. I guess I'd say just to remember that, you know, I've been in faculty meetings or in, you know, meetings of chairs at the medical school and stuff in which the issue of fairness toward uh, women and minorities and stuff, it, it's, it's treated as fairness. It's not fairness, it's opportunity. I mean, there's really no reason why 7.4% of the people in the world should have so much power. And if you ask yourself, is that going really well? <laughs> I mean, not really. So, so let's, let's, bring, let's bring some more opinions. I mean, these are really talented people who by not giving you know, them a fair shake, us a fair shake, you're missing out on a lot. So just remember um, when you're, you know, dissed in some way, you know, um, people need to hear your voice. The world will be a better place. So that, that helps me with my confidence sometimes. It's like, well, it's not like they're really doing that well. <laughs> so I'm going to speak up. Yeah. Thank you again. Can you get a round of applause for these speakers? This is really, really great. Thank you for the reflection and forethought you put in before you even came on stage. Um, I think this was a really informative and useful panel for all of us. Thank you to the audience. I see plenty of male as well as female in the audience. Um, and off to lunch. Let's go. <laughs> we have 40 minutes.